Okay, September 4th, 2014. I woke up still exhausted, and by the time I was cycling to Mitte a few hours later, I was wondering if I was suffering from some condition or other, some ailment like chronic fatigue syndrome, and I saw myself convalescent somewhere in the future, reliant on the home help of others for the rest of my life. I made coffee earlier with filters in the kitchen, and it was a mess, and I tried to work on the novel, but nothing really happened with it, so I gave up and went into the office. There, I finished the press release for the next exhibition and just tried to get things done. The effect book went to print, so that was good. I left early and went to Primark at Alexanderplatz for some reason, I have no idea why, and I thought about buying clothes, but really I thought how fucked it was that so much clothes could be so cheap. I got socks. I also went to TK Maxx looking for shoes. I want big fucking black boots, but there was none, so I got a military standard protective shell sh shield for my iPhone. Ugly as fuck, but it will have to save it. On the way back, I stopped off at a Sam on Sonnenalle for a hummus teller. Good stuff. I forgot to pay and had to cycle around and go back. They hadn't even noticed that I hadn't paid. At home, I took a nap, and Eleven messaged me just as I was getting started with that. On my way home, I bumped into I, which was random, but made sense with what her book launch at Archive Books. She is such a weirdo, a real complainer. Within seconds of meeting her, she was complaining, and I was put off by the very idea of going to Portugal this winter. Couldn't imagine spending more time around people like her than I would have to. I got up and packed and showered and made my way over to Archive. S was going to pick me up there, but it was quiet, and the presentation was over quickly. It was done with J M, who I am not sure if she is still in Britannia or not, she is smart, bubblegum American accent, hair that is waxen and olive oil soaked. I went over to the O'Tenenbaum and P was there drinking at the bar. I had a beer with him and H and talked shit and random pickups, etc. Then I went to Sudstern where I met S, bought booze, went to a party. It was a 60th birthday for a poet. There was a nice group of people, a lot of whom we didn't know. J, S and H N, H turned up, wondering what I was doing there. Met people from Monday night talked about hitchhiking in Ireland. S suggested I don't read from my novel in Vienna, but more diaries. But I told her that that was admitting defeat somehow. It's also narcissistic and just untenable. Left me wondering, though, perhaps there is a way to introduce it. I got a bit drunk. There were nice speeches, poetry. I left as Eleven was messaging me about helping her write an abstract for some symposium on Bracca L. Ettinger, who I had never heard of. She agreed to come over easy enough. She got to mine by 1.30 a.m. At this stage, very tired and in need of a drink. We drank ouzo, and she smoked her joint, talking shit and talking shit about my screensavers. Turns out she went through my Facebook chats, those with A and C. I know because today C's chat box was open, in which I admit in the conversation that I'm a junkie over her. Don't know what to think. Who cares, I guess? We had some good sex for a long time, a terribly short amount of sleep in the end. Chronic indeed. So uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and Helga, thank you so much for that workout. Uh, that was uh, not exactly what I was expecting at all. Uh, so I'm John Holton from Berlin by way of other places. And I write prose uh, amongst other texts, um, as Boris so uh, uh, astutely said, observed. I write fiction and fact. Uh, you just heard a diary entry of which is a result of that practice. I'm going to read an extract from Work in Progress, uh, which is my next novel called Oslo, Norway, um, which is a love story. And it's also a, a, it's a love story about falling in and out of love and falling in and out of fiction, I guess. This is from, um, I guess, the second section, which is uh, somehow has the pretension to be metaphysical. It'll only last a little bit. Uh, it won't be too long. Oh, you're a gentleman. Look at that. Great. After that workout, I was like, I'm only going to perform if I get a beer. Uh, it's so good doing a workout like that on a Friday night, because now we can all feel totally, um, those of us who did it, uh, those of you who didn't do it, you're just going to have to feel really bad, I guess. But the re those of us who did do it, we can uh, eat and make merry and get drunk and do loads of drugs and feel great about ourselves. Exercise does that, I guess. Uh, also, tonight's great. It's with such, I love Vienna, and uh, tonight I am, <laughs> I am uh, playing to the gallery. Uh, tonight I am screening the fourth and last installment in some trash video commercials that I have made, um, blips that I have called. Uh, I run a publishing house called Broken Dimanche Press, uh, along with some other editors, and they, we publish my books. So in this book, uh, I'm taking it on 
uh, myself to be chief publicist. Uh, <laughs> it's very, I'm very serious. I'm chief marketing department. So these videos will be playing. Uh, they're shot on a, on a phone uh, in Oslo. So this section starts off with a quote from Inger Christiansen, the great Danish poet from Det or It. Meanwhile, in the interim, while the sun still has excess enough to dole out death so slowly that it looks like life, life keeps up the fiction. Toyin got the fear for. Let us not ask then for now or for something for nothing. What was is consigned to the world and what wasn't is consigned to time. To be is easy, not to be is difficult. Let us move toward being then. The end is something none of us can know intimately in the present, and yet it is straight, straight up ahead, certain. No, look no further than the bottom of this page. We are and we will not be. The line between is what makes up our life, like the pages bearing out fiction between the covers of a book. The ends, nuttiness, until such time that things begin again. The destruction of worlds is mirrored in the mer slowing currents of our sun, the extraction of things from the ground, the emptying of reserves, let us embrace nuttiness and try to fill it with being, because in our ever-increasing specialized imaginations, we trundle toward nothing and absence, not with any ceremony or sanctity, but blindly. Our domain over matter, things, people, is only ever progression downwards, away from the light of our dying sun, into the empty space of a world unfurling, fiction. Let us introduce a street. It is dark with figures moving down its incline. It is in the east of the city and connects two different neighborhoods. The figures are returning home. Their hands touch each other in twine. A smile appears in the dark. Bus terminal. William Day was first seen arriving into Oslo bus station, but that is not quite right. He was rather first seen in Dublin airport, sitting with a coffee in Ritatsa Cafe upstairs in the food hall in departures. He was over two hours early for his flight and appeared as a mind made up of lines and angles growing larger between the coordinates of these two cities. Then he is lost from view, just after security, in amongst the shoppers, hurriers and worriers. This is where the story of William Day begins, in Dublin airport on his way to Oslo, one of the known ports of the world. He appears on his Ryanair flight, suspended between the hard vectors and dark blocks that designate city streets on a map. Blue and yellow surround him, and he suffers the displeasure of an overpriced service trolley. He closes his eyes and shifts his legs, but feels the seat and the one in front of him press hard against his flesh. He feels the slow progress of the service trolley and the overly loud air steward's transactions. His eyes remain closed, and he is caught between what is there and what is not, what he can see and what he cannot, between the make-believe and the very real. Midgard. Lucky was the third in the rankings of the important gods, a troublemaker and shapeshifter. His home was made when empty space was filling with our world and nothing was becoming something and stories could start to be told. Loki is one of those characters from the northern world and is encountered in the telling of Ranyarok, or the dead of the gods. The world formed from nothing. First there was space, total, a void. Then there was more things, grass, oceans. Sooner or later there was Loki. But we do not know Loki, only bits of him, and these bits together work toward forming his character in the segues between other stories of gods and beasts, beginnings and ends. It is not just in fiction that an empty canvas is populated with the made up. Our world is bare and we step into it with our thoughts and expectations about those people and things we know nothing about. Other people. Mark Vine. William Day is real because he is moving through space, a coordinate on the map. He got off the bus and walked out of the station. It was approaching dusk and the gloaming closeness of night accentuated the two tall buildings that loomed up at the end of the street, Oslo's own gate, and beyond them the dull promise of a body of water, a harbour. Further in time, William Day walks into the cafe and smiles at the waitress. William Day requests ASB at new version of Ranyarok in the Dykeman's bibliotheque, but doesn't take any other book in the meantime and walks out without fag or book or any other accoutrement. William and Sybil wait in the warmth of the bus terminal for a bus to her summer cottage, staring silently out at the December snow. Standard gallery moved before the world's end from Hegde de Haugwein to Voldemort Transgotte in 2013. One day after the kebab, William notices the gallery is no longer where it was, where he first met Sybil, and he felt this fitting. 
He would stare at the illuminated ski jump and Hulmenkullen often and imagine being able to fly. How it would change all his relations to space, the world. One night, he was followed as he left his friend Lars's apartment on Oribskotte. When the man reached out and put a hand on his shoulder, William flung a punch and ran wildly down the deserted street and didn't stop until he was in front of the police headquarters. He sat on a bar in Wangelstrasse in Berlin, waiting for David, his brother, to return from work to let him in. He stared at the mural, This is not America, and wondered what the implications of it were. Sometimes he bought vegetables at Brugatte, sometimes not, but he always smiled or waved at the happy Chinese woman working in the grocery shop. Later still, Sybil met her friends at the cafe behind the cathedral because at one time they all fancied one of the waiters there, but he long left for another job. They no longer remembered why it was there that they met, and no longer at Major Stewart. William loved Jungstugger and the big Labour Party building. He never tired of walking across it and always tried a new direction to enter and exit the square. So on and so forth, these spaces continue. Bogstavain. The world is bare, but people keep populating it. Far from home, they are travelling, going places, meeting each other, crossing each other and interacting with each other. Let us introduce another character into it, another moving coordinate. Trifanovic or Trifke, soon he'll be called by another name. And he is here because he got deep enough into moving drugs around that eventually his route brought him north and he supplies the richer in what they don't have. This Trifke is not unlike Loki, actually. He shifted and reinvented himself his whole life, again and again, until one day he was in Oslo, drinking champagne on the west side of town, and got himself invited back to a Nockspiel, what the Norwegians called an after-party, borrowed from the German. He thought to himself in the taxi to the house, wherever the house was, he would never remember, how the Norwegians were strong people, good people, honest drinkers, unlike the French, who were cowardly and polite, he thought. He remembered by some grace of God the names of the two girls who had cajoled him to get into their taxi, not that it had taken much, Camilla and Sibyl. But this is before William Day took his uncomfortable Ryanair flight, and so this smudged detail can be lost, taken away, and now it's gone, and Trifka has disappeared once more. Let us not ask then for now. Mark Vein too. So William is in space and walks into the cafe and smiles at the waitress. This is only the tip of what exists. William Day is not here, not before us, and perhaps all that can be known right now are dreams abused by words spun true with a philosophy of lying born from cynicism. It is what we are trying to give him, after all, a past, a future, a present. After some time at the bar, watching as the waitress's smile disappeared, so all that was left to her were her two pigtails running down either side of her face, Sybil arrived with a sigh a sign to William of her tiredness and forced resignation of the necessity of their meeting. Some time later, she put her hand down on the table and the conversation paused for a moment. She was saying how he doesn't know how to be loved, that he only knows how to be calculated. He doesn't say anything because these words stir nothing in him. He looks past her out the window and admires again the tram design as the blue streak screeches past, the bolted weight of 60 tons, 32 eight axle aluminium made eight years before. She continued, it's why you've discovered jealousy, want to be omniscient, know everything. And so when you don't know everything, you make it up. And the Serb, he said, what about him? William asked after another slow moment of silence. See what I mean? The Serb has fucked up himself. He's in trouble from what I gather. Can't say I'm sorry to hear that. Well, you should be. Why should I be? Because he's my friend. Fuck that, he's not your friend. He's not even Camilla's friend. He only cares about himself and what he can get out of people. Great, I'll leave it at that. Uh, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. The, the book will come out in November. You see how good a publicist I am? You can all uh, pre-order copies. Uh, and if you do want to find out more about why... I, did, this, did the video screen? No. Oh, okay. Uh, th that, was the, that was the next part. Well, maybe you could screen them now, uh, if that's possible. Um, so uh, if you want to find out more about the videos or my novel, on my website, I write an aside, uh, which is very... Uh, ambitious and pretentious, I guess, where I explain my publicity uh, campaign. Um, but thanks. Yeah. <laughs> this is a continuation of my reading.